second week in Winchester, and this is a great finish to our great week. Uh, excuse my voice, I was at a sporting event last night and was yelling. <laughs> Obviously didn't yell enough, but um, no, it's, it's great for, to have you all here, and we're excited about uh, what we're going to hear this morning. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, the best return on an investment is education. And I think we all know the uh, importance of having skilled, competent, literate uh, workforce. And we're excited to hear about what these uh, fine folks have in store for us and have been what they've been doing in our community and what their future plans are. We're planning on giving them about eight to ten minutes to kind of give you an overview because we want to leave plenty of time for questions afterwards. So, first up is Mr. Paul Christie, who is the superintendent of our Clark County school system. So let's give Paul a big welcome. I'll move over to the center. I feel like I could just pull up a chair at the front there and might be a better spot. I'd like to thank everybody for being here this morning. I, too, if my voice is a little weak, it was because I was at a sporting event last night. And, then, and unless you were an Auburn fan or possibly a Louisville fan, it didn't fare well last night for us. Uh, when I talked with Bruce this morning when I came in, uh, Bruce Manley was a former student of mine. I always throw that out. He gets tired of me doing that to him. But he was a former <laughs> student of mine. And I'm sitting up here this morning just talking and looking through some of my notes about things that I wanted to hit on quick. And I'm looking at about an hour's worth of a presentation, and Bruce says, oh, we've got about eight or ten minutes to get through this. So uh, if, if there's any questions, I'll try to answer questions at the end. We'll go through this as quickly as I can. Um, kind of to get to, to talk about where we are right now, the first thing I want to say, and I'm going to jump ahead in some slides, and we'll, you'll see this in a, in a few minutes. We're not going to go to it, but I want to say to you, I'm proud to stand in front of you and say Clark County for the third year, Clark County Public Schools are proficient. In, in, in our district. Our district is a proficient school district. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that <clears throat> Excuse me, in just a moment. I want to talk about a little bit of a background to get us to where we are, where we, where we have come from. I think it's important to recognize that. For all intents and purposes, this district, the school board, the staff, the administrators have virtually rebuilt the school district in the last three years uh, through uh, consolidation, which was the Central and Fannie Bush coming together to make the justice, the new elementary school there, new grade configurations, and I'll mention that again in a second. The redistribution of the staff in these grade reconfigurations was huge. We moved at the beginning of the last year 200 staff members in our district. That's every teacher virtually, when you look at it, virtually every teacher from preschool to eighth grade was moved. I don't think there was but one person between kindergarten teacher to the last eighth grade teacher that was back in the same classroom that they were in the preceding year. That is a huge, huge undertaking and a huge change. And I think we're starting to see the benefits from that. The redistricting of students. The board took on the redistricting. And I can stand in front of you today and say that with the redistricting in our schools, you have at the elementary levels, you have the most socioeconomically balanced, uh, ethnic, ethnically balanced student bodies at all four of these elementary schools that you've ever seen. And I think, again, that's starting to bear for us, too, in the, in the testing process. Closing the elementary schools, and I promise this is going to be the last time that I ever mention the closing of the elementary schools. I think we're way beyond that now, but I think it's important that we go back and we remember that that's where we came from, and that was closing of four of those schools to get to where we are now, and that was required by the State Department. That wasn't something that this board took on necessarily. That was something that was forced upon them they, that they had to deal with. Opening of at least one new elementary school. Of course, Justice was one year before last, and we opened up a new one with being concrete last year. The relocation of the preschool has been a huge move for us. The preschool, and I keep talking to the teachers, I want you to remember where you came from, because when I came here 10 years ago, I know where they came from because I helped move them. I helped move them from the trailers that was in the back of every one of the buildings, one single trailer in the back of the building. That's where the preschool was. And they moved from there. We were able to move up to a facility where they were all together. We brought all the preschool together in the district. And now I'm proud to say that they are now located in the Hannah McClure building, and they're in a facility that we own and that we can maintain and we can do the things that we need for those kids, and they have the space that they need there, and we're continuing to upgrade that, and we'll talk a little bit more about some possibilities for that preschool in the near future, too. 
the creating of the four, the four elementary schools, this all kind of resulted in, in the creating of the four elementary schools, a five, six intermediate school, which has been very successful. That's helped a lot of parents, eased a lot of parents' minds. We've pulled the sixth graders back, and they're in a group with now fifth and sixth graders, and they're transported with the fifth and sixth graders below, and they're not on the buses with the high schoolers. So that was a huge thing there. And then we have the seven, eight junior high school, that, that separation, and then obviously we have our, our high school at the new GRC. This past year, um, along with everything else that's happened, uh, the district put together a strategic planning committee. Uh, we looked at many things. We have some long-range plans. I'll not get into a lot of those. Some of those plans that were developed by this strategic planning are already being implemented in the schools as we renovate these schools with the new technologies that's been placed in these schools. New resource officers has been placed at the schools. We're up to three of those now, and hopefully with the things that are looking good in our safe schools, the, the uh, legislators and folks have, have seen the importance of safe schools and these resource officers. They have in turn kind of upped the the financial uh, support for these areas. So if there is a good possibility that we're looking at the possibility of by the end of this year or next year, we would have the finances provided them to provide another SRO, which is a school resource officer, which would put us with one to work our elementary schools, one at our middle school level, and two at our high school level. I think that's going to be a huge improvement. We did come up with a new district and vision uh, was established, and it's one community, one vision, life ready. And that's been a, a strong focus of us there at, the, uh, at, at Clark County Schools is, is the life ready piece in addition to all the other things that we do with testing. <clears throat> the school report card information, you're going to see it there. I'll just kind of go across that quickly. I would like to mention it. All of the information from all of our schools, the school report cards are now posted on our websites. Please go there and look at that. If you need copies of anything, you're welcome to stop by the board and we'll provide you with whatever you would need. I would encourage you to look at that. I'd like to mention that at the elementary schools, we saw increases in uh, math from a 46.8% to a 55.3% this year. Language mechanics also increased and on-demand also increased at the middle school levels. Uh, we saw an increase in the number of students scoring in proficient distinguished levels in reading. It increased from a 50, 52 something to a 52, 2.7, I'm sorry, to a 53. Our high school, very proud of our high school, in addition to the other schools. Saw an increase of students scoring at the proficient and distinguished levels in math, science, on demand writing, and language mechanics. Um, you'll see those scores. I'll not read those to you at this time since Bruce has cut me to 10 minutes. I'll let you look through those. And um, I want to also mention one of the things we're extremely proud of that we made a, and this has been not only an effort at the school system, but this has been a partnership with BCTC, the Industrial Foundation, other community organizations, other community groups, our college and career readiness. I've come from a background, I'm an old vocational person. I was a, I came from a vocational background before I went into education. I was in vocational. I was actually working here in Winchester at Freeman Corporation. I was plant manager there, so I have some industrial background. One of my things, and I told the board when I, when I was actually interviewing for the position of superintendent, one of my concerns is I understand, I fully understand and I appreciate the importance of the testing and the college readiness, but I feel like that we at some points in the past have done our kids who were not college bound, we've done them an injustice. And we need to be looking at all students. And I think the state has picked up on this too with this college, with the career readiness piece. And through that, one of the things I'm very proud of, you can look at there, in 2013, we were at 48% uh, that were college or career ready. You see, in 14, we went to 59. This year, we were at 79.7%. That's college or career ready. Now, when you look at the college, if they test and they score in their college and career ready, there's some additional bonus points. When we, when the state tabulated our college and career readiness for our high school this year, we were at 96.4 percent. That's something that we're all proud of. That took a lot of efforts by a lot of people. One of the things, and Mr. Kendrick will probably talk here in a few minutes and I'll step on what he's going to say, but I think one of the, one of the best things that ever happened in the construction of that high school, in the planning of that high school, and that the board and the others had the foresight to recognize was the fact that you put that area technology center and connected it to that high school. The kids all walk the same hall now. There is no difference. 
we have kids that are going into the medical profession to be doctors, uh, scientists, everything else in the, in the area tech center. We've broken the boundaries down, and I think that's why you're starting to see a lot of this increase in the college and career readiness. I will tell you that my goal is to get to 100% on that. I think it's only fair that we get every student that leaves Clark County Public Schools to be college or career ready. Celebrations, I told you I'd get back to this. In this year, we're a proficient district for the third year straight. Uh, that was really exciting the first year or the second year maybe, but now that it's the third year, it, it, we, we're moving our goals higher. That's the expectation now. That's not, not the exception. That is the expectation now that we're going to be proficient. Uh, I, can, I will add that, that Shearer and Justice were proficient for the first time ever in the history of those schools. That's huge. We had a couple others that were real close. I think next year we're going to see the vast majority of our schools are going to be proficient. Our goal is to be a distinguished district. Now, to add to that, this year, George Rogers Clark was ranked distinguished. Not only distinguished, but they were distinguished among the distinguished. They were a school of distinction. That means they're in the top 95 percentile in the state. That's something to be very proud of. That took a lot of efforts by, by things that were put in place by our board and the administrators in that school and the staff that taught those students, and probably most importantly, the work of the students in those buildings, in that building. On the same line along the high school, there was an article recently came out in the U.S. News and World Report that ranked George Rogers Clark High School as the 17th best high school in the, in the state of Kentucky. I like to add to that, they were ranked 1,726 in the nation out of about 20,000. So that's not only state recognition, that's national recognition. <coughs> so we, we talk about what's uh, on the curriculum for, for Clark County. One of the things, I think, first thing that we've done that was enacted last year that we're already starting to see the benefits. This year, for the first year, the math scores were higher than our language arts scores. Our math scores traditionally have been the scores that we've had to work on consistently. We've implemented a new math program, kindergarten through eight. Uh, I think after only one year of that curriculum, we're already starting to see the benefits of that for our students. I expect to see that increase even more next year. Now, in the meantime, we've also added a K-8 curriculum in the ELA, the language arts programs. So the expectation there is that the students, no matter which school they're going to, they're getting the same curriculum, the same classwork, the same things are going in equally in every one of our schools. So the, the thought there was if we're equalizing everything else in the schools in the curriculum, the same things should be taught in each of the buildings so that every child has the same opportunity, opportunities regardless of which school they're going to. Attendance is, is a, this year is one of our major focuses, and it should be, as it should be. Uh, students cannot learn if they're not there. Uh, this past two years, in the last two years, we've had our, our highest and our third highest attendance rates that we've that we have you know, on record as far as attendance in Clark County Schools. Uh, first and foremost, that's beneficial to the students to be there and be in the seats. That's how they learn. That's where they learn. That, in addition, that does help with our SEEK formula and our funding there. That does help enable us to uh, gain financial uh, from financially from the state, which allows us to do additional things in the schools. Uh, one, the one thing that we have coming up now that you may start to see or hear about in the community is there every four years every district has to go through a, a, a local planning. We're back into that rotation this year and we're currently assembling the local planning committee. It's made up of community members, uh, teachers, parents, uh, administrators, and other workers throughout the district, uh, local planning and zoning. At our next meeting on Tuesday night, I hope to have all those names in front of the board so that they can finalize that committee and we plan on beginning the work on that sometime hopefully in, in, uh, in November. Uh, some of the things that's on the horizon there, we still have, uh, we have purchased property out on the corner of the bypass in 60, uh, the old Aerocoats building. That building now is owned by the Board of Education and that's going to be the future home of a new preschool. And so uh, our goal there is to make that preschool a uh, state of art building for our young kids, just like we've done at all the other buildings that we've tried to work on. Uh, in addition to the 
the preschool. We have renovations that are currently, we're currently undergoing at Campbell Junior High in, a, in the wings there. We're going through the building uh, there, uh, changing out all the lighting, we're upgrading there. Uh, it will, with the infrastructure that's going into that building, that will make it probably one of the top buildings as far as infrastructure, but only because it's going to be one of the newest buildings. And as we bring on the preschool, that would, it will take on the same kinds of infrastructure there. It's really tough to stay on top of the things technology-wise. When we started the high school, we had the plans of what we were going to do for technology. And when we got to the, toward the end of the construction, when the technology piece started, we had to go back and totally revamp the technology that we were looking at because the things that were available then were not even on the table to talk about when we started the construction three years ago. So three to five years, there's just total changes in the technology. So that's a very difficult thing to stay on top of. A lot of our schools now, <clears throat> excuse me, have the, the infrastructure that will support a lot of the up and coming things. Uh, the other thing that the LPC will be discussing is the athletic complex is the final piece at the at George Rogers Clark High School. So some tough decisions and a lot of information I'm sure that will be presented to this group and they'll come back and make those uh, presentations to the board and we'll move on from there. I had a couple other slides but I know I'm going to be stepping on the toes of Dr. Kudak and, and, and Ms. Hefner so I'm going to, and Mr. Kindred so I'm going to kind of drop it and let it go with that and I'll be glad to take any questions when we get to the end of the program. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Dr. Kudak who is the board chair of our, our county uh, school system. <clears throat> I actually went over this list at a chamber meeting, I think it was in June, and I should have known from some of the positives here that when our test scores came back they would be as good as they were, but I wasn't thinking that far ahead. So I'm just going to go back and review these in light of where we are now. Uh, Mr. Christie said we were proficientists of three years in a row, and I think from here going forward that's the expectation. That's our floor. I think we can do better as a school district. So proficiency is going to be something that we expect from here on out. Ms. Christie uh, pointed out our facilities as a whole are the best they've ever been. But we've got a couple more pieces left before we can say all of our facilities have been completely redone, so we're close to that. Uh, I'll touch on teachers. I think our teachers are doing well, and I th they seem happy. We have a tool called the TELL score, and uh, that's something that is distributed by the state to teachers, and it's a questionnaire about working conditions, and it's blinded to the district, and it's blinded to the state, and it's, uh, it's secure. All those uh, responses are aggregated and uh, assembled by the state and sent back to the school districts. Our scores have been increasing over time. We have some work to do, but the general trend there is up. Uh, our district is financially healthy. There was a period of time not too terribly long ago where our district was in management by the state. Uh, but our contingency fund is healthy, and we actually have enough money in the contingency fund to do some things that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to do, like uh, con do, uh, continue to do uh, AP testing. We actually started with AP, enhanced AP testing through a grant called Advance Kentucky, and when that grant money run out, we had enough money in our contingency to continue that testing, and I think that's one of the keys and the anchors of the success for GRC High School. Our attendance has been good. Uh, uh, it was the fifth highest ever this past year. Board community relations are much improved. I'm sure everybody in this room would agree to that. Uh, our preschool is now a true school, not a program, and it will have a, a permanent home uh, in several years. Uh, and we have district-wide math, uh, math reading and writing curriculum that's consistent in all schools for the first time. So uh, just a couple things about GRC. I was really surprised to see it ranked 17th in the state by US News and World Report. That's a big deal, and a lot of people the, we didn't solicit that, we didn't ask for that, that just kind of showed up on our doorstep one day. And uh, their, their rating rubric is something that is uh, uh, pretty standard nationwide, and a lot of people look at those. When you're sending your, who's got kids that are going off to college, right? You read the US News and World Report rankings, you know, they look at from a college standpoint which colleges are, are effective in terms of, you know, how much tuition you pay and how much you can, you know, how much is your degree worth when you get out of that college. And their rankings, I think, are, their ranking system is very well established. So, and that's, a, that's not a ranking system looking at Kentucky. That's a ranking system looking nationwide. So, GRC is the most energy efficient school in the state. Mr. Christie didn't point that out, but it is. Uh, it's energy star rated and uh, uh, it was number one in the state this past year. That's important because we used to be spending a lot of money on energy bills and now we are taking the money we can save on energy bills and put it into education. Our college and career rate is the highest it's ever been. Our graduation rate is the highest ever. 
Um, I think uh, one of the things that GRC has needed to work on over the years is getting kids ready for college. I used to hear the complaint a lot that, oh, my child was at the top of the class at GRC and they went to uh, four-year college and you know they had a really hard time adjusting to the curriculum. And I think I'm hearing that less and less because the kids are doing more and more college level work. There's a lot of dual credit classes, there's a lot of AP classes. Our test uh, pass rate for our AP classes is high. It's close to about 60%. Uh, AP credit, if you get three, four, or five, depending on what you get on the test, you can get credit at any college nationwide. So dual credit class uh, credits transfer to the state university system. So, and we have kids uh, graduating with significant numbers of college credits, and that translates into savings long term because if you enter college with 15 credits, that's half a semester. So, and we have some uh, uh, seniors leaving our school in that situation, so that's a good thing. Our dropout rate is the lowest it's ever been. We're to the point now we look at individual dropouts and we talk about individual dropouts and what could we do about this person? Is there anything we could do here? You know, we never talked about individuals before. It was a, a, a bigger number than that. So, uh, <clears throat> our, uh, Mr. Christie didn't mention the Phoenix Academy, but the Phoenix Academy has been recognized as a model school, a model alternative school. And uh, in past years, it's been one of the 16 uh, uh, best alternative edu education programs in the state. So. Uh, just a couple numbers about uh, the class of 2015 at our scholarship uh, night this past summer. $2.2 million in scholarships were awarded. Now, that includes SEEK money and uh, people going to in-state schools, but that's still a lot of money for college. And the current class has seven governor scholars, which I think is an impressive number. So, finally, I just wanted to say that um, this used to be a district of schools. And I think you can say we are now a school district. I think we're unified, I think we're efficient, and I think we're moving forward. Thank you. Who's next? <laughs> thank you very much. Great to get that report. Great things are happening. Um, first of all, I want to thank Bruce Manley and the staff here at BCTC for hosting us. So let's give Bruce a round of applause. Winchester Federal, who is who sponsored your coffee and donuts this morning, so we want to thank them. And welcome to your building. <laughs> uh, this is Dr. Augusta Julian. She's president of the BCTC community, and we are happy to be here with you and happy to hear from you. So yeah, the floor is yours. Well, good morning. You know, we're always happy to uh, host our favorite community. Uh, here at uh, the BCTC campus, so um, thank you for being here. Um, Bruce and I are going to tag team, so I'm just going to talk a little bit. Many of you know the college very well, so I'll apologize to uh, folks who are connected uh, directly and, and uh, regularly with us, but i um, just going to do a quick sort of overview. Um, so you know that we're one of 16 colleges in KCTCS, and BCTC actually has seven campuses. So uh, it's very confusing sometimes. Um, people will sometimes tack an S on the back of BCTC, but we are a college as a part of a system, even though we have a number of sites. Um, we're still at about 16,000 students annually. Our enrollment is dropping uh, as the economy improves. The enrollment in higher education generally, but particularly in community and technical colleges, goes down. So uh, we were up about 18,000 three years ago. So we're dropping just a little bit each year as people find jobs, um, as they uh, can go into jobs without having to have a lot of training, as businesses grow and look for more employees. Um, we do pretty much draw from in the entire state of Kentucky, and we have 40 programs of study-ish. Um, sometimes even we don't um, all agree on a certificate, is it a certificate, if it's embedded in a program. So depending on how you count them, it's uh, about 40 or uh, it's about 60 um, because we have a lot of embedded certificates that you can get even if you're in like an associate degree program. You can stop short of the degree if you need to for some reason and get um, several certificates so that you have evidence of having earned some skills. Um, just a few things that we're calling areas of excellence for the college. Um, the one that you hear a lot about, particularly if you're in manufacturing, is what we call our learn and work programs. 
And the main one, the one that began it all, is the Toyota um, Manufacturing uh, Association called FAME, Federation of Advanced Manufacturing Education. And um, it is, has been operating uh, really kind of within the Toyota plant in Georgetown for about 10 years. And we call it integrated work and learn or learn and work because the students actually go to school um, two days a week, eight to five-ish, and um, then they work three days a week. So they're getting paid for that work. Um, they are able to fund their schooling without having to have a lot of um, other resources, loans or whatever. And um, they are able to take those skills that they learn in class the next day onto the shop floor. So this is a very much a trend in uh, technical education. And um, we do have one of the model programs in this, the nation. We've won awards for it. So it takes a really um, important and critical connection between employers and um, the college. Um, because, you know, Toyota or the other manufacturers that are now a part of Kentucky Fame, I think we're up to about 16 manufacturers. Are any of the um, Clark County manufacturers in that group? Um, I'm not sure. Um, but it's not just Toyota anymore. It really is um, a collaborat uh, collaborative of uh, manufacturers from across our region. And, in fact, there are, I think, six uh, chapters. So there are six other parts of the Commonwealth where there are manufacturers who have come together with their local community and technical college to start this kind of program. So what we are interested in is um, moving out of manufacturing into other s industry sectors. And we're about to start a project where we're looking at machining um, and working with some machining companies that might be willing to have that kind of um, direct integrated partnership where students would go from our um, uh, computerized machining and manufacturing program and have that kind of work and learn situation. So there are others out there that are possibilities as well. Uh, the North American Racing Academy, um, again, you probably know about. Uh, it is also, it's a different kind of work and learn program because the students go, I think it's three semesters or two semesters, and then they do a semester of um, placement with a trainer, a farm, um, you know, some kind of racing establishment where they're actually working and getting credits for that semester of uh, on-site work. Um, Up-to-date industry needs, we're always trying to look at what the new and uh, coming um, industry needs are. So um, some things that we've done recently include biotech, uh, digital graphic arts, which is the whole uh, computer gaming industry, uh, informatics, which is database management, uh, green energy, and then health information tech, which is huge. All the hospitals are having to go to um, some new software in terms of maintaining medical records. Uh, job placement, um, really uh, high quality uh, training leads to job placement, lots of demand, um, particularly in the um, health field, but also in um, things like electrical tech and um, some of the other more technical programs. Um, 2014 was a very good year. We celebrated our 75th anniversary as a college beginning in 1939. Uh, we opened um, the new campus and uh, were awarded the gold uh, LEED certification. Um, so in 39, we had some programs that are still actually active today, and that was a part of the Fayette County Schools at that time. Um, and uh, in 1965, um, we actually became kind of a state institution uh, coming out of the Fayette County Schools, and um, LTI started as a part of UK that eventually became LCC, that eventually came together with Central Kentucky to form LCC. So we had a good year that year. Um, our challenges for the future, it really is dealing with resource issues and uh, all the societal issues that are out there and trying to maintain and support student success. So, um, you know, college readiness, um, the Clark County Schools, you know, along with many others in, in the Commonwealth now, beginning to really focus and, and improve um, students' uh, abilities coming out of high school so that they can be successful as they begin their college careers. And uh, it takes a real partnership um, 
to, to do that. And I, I, we, we appreciate very much our relationship with the, the schools here in Clark County. Uh, developmental ed is a part of that. If students come out and they are not ready for uh, English, math, uh, reading, then it is up to us to try to help them get there. So um, whether it's an adult who hasn't been in school for many, many years, or maybe a high school student who struggled a little bit in high school uh, and wants to go to college and needs that extra boost, um, that's a really important function that we have and a continuing challenge to be sure that people are ready um, not only to access higher education, but to be successful when they get there. Something we're talking a lot about is achievement gaps. I know the public schools deal with that as well. Um, we want every student to be successful. Um, some start out with more family support, more books in the home, more um, you know, direct support for their educational experience, and others don't. And so um, we really want to look at those barriers to success in higher education and figure out how we can, can come behind a student with all those other kind of supports if they didn't get them earlier in life um, and allow them to be successful at this point. Um, we still struggle a bit with what are called completion rates or graduation rates. Um, we are um, a very diverse uh, institution. We have some students who come and they only want to get a couple of courses so they can get a job, you know, begin with some basic skills, maybe come back later. Um, we have students who are on their way to a bachelor's degree. They know they're going to be, uh, you know, an accountant or an attorney or whatever else they, they have in mind and they see us as a um, less expensive but high quality way to uh, make that transition. Um, so they come in with all kinds of different uh, goals which is a little different than your four-year institutions. Um, so uh, some of these uh, rates that you see in terms of graduation, some students never intended to graduate, some you know, fell off track somewhere along the way, uh, you know, things happen, um, but we still need to deal with this and we need to be sure that every student leaves us with a marketable skill, whether it's a degree which we want them to get, we want them to go on to a bachelor's degree if that's appropriate. Um, costs and tuition, you hear a lot about this. Uh, it's an issue for us as well. You know, we're a much lower cost institution, but um, we still have students who struggle to pay tuition. So it's an, it's an issue and we'll continue to deal with that. The cost of technology uh, and the changes in technology uh, are also an issue and, and we struggle with that too. Uh, job readiness, being sure that they leave with competencies, credit for prior learning is a big issue. Um, you know, particularly uh, students coming out of the military bring with them a lot of skills, so we need to figure out how to give them credit for those skills and advance them toward a degree. Uh, and then the job skills programs, which I mentioned. Um, you've probably seen this chart. Uh, on the left is employment, and on the right is uh, um, uh, uh, earnings. Um, and in the middle is uh, your um, educational level. So you can see that, you know, we all know this. More education gives you more money, better employment outcomes. This is our chart for um, resources, which again continues to be a challenge. Um, the bottom line is state appropriation. Uh, this is to BCTC specifically. And the top line is our um, tuition, which again is going down because enrollment's going down. Uh, we've got the Georgetown Scott County campus coming, um, fully funded by the legislature, uh, under construction right now. And then we've got the Newtown campus um, with the second building uh, as a part of the Bill Smart project that we've been raising money for locally with a three to one bonding match coming up um, from the legislature. I think that's it for me. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce. Thank you, Dr. Julian. I just want to uh, highlight the, um, um, what we're doing here at the Winchester Clark County campus. Um, we opened in May of 2008, so we're getting ready to celebrate um, eight years here at this location, thanks to the community and thanks to the uh, industrial authority for donating the land. Um, the um, most enro uh, recent enrollment numbers that we have are from 2014, those are our official uh, CPE enrollment numbers. Last year we were at 451 students. Um, we're continuing to track enrollment this fall and right now we are um, 
uh, have a little bit more enrollment, so we're up right now about 1.7%. Um, that's an unofficial rate right now because the CPE snapshot hasn't been taken yet. That'll happen in about another two weeks. Um, but we plan to be up in enrollment, which is really good for us. Um, the average age of students here at the Winchester Clark County campus is about 23 years old. Um, and then a few other demographics there. But we do pull from um, a lot of counties around us, um, including Powell County, Montgomery County, Estill County, and Madison County. Um, so we are a regional campus, not just of BCTC, but for the region around us here at Winchester. Um, here at the campus, we do mainly transfer programs, um, which is Associates in Arts and Associates in Science, but we have worked hard in our partnerships, especially with Mr. Kindred at the Area Technology Center. Without him and his nice facilities, we wouldn't be able to add programs like um, our welding certificate that we started this uh, fall and the One Plus One Integrated Engineering Technology Program, which gives high school students one year of the industrial maintenance degree that they need, and then after they graduate high school, they finish up the second year at BCTC. So we wouldn't be able to do that with the good partnerships from the Clark County Public School Systems and the Area Technology Centers. Um, we also have a new program that we started this fall in partnership with Clark Regional Medical Center for the medical assistant uh, certification. And they came to us and said, we need some medical assistance. So we said, we can provide that. And um, they're willing to give scholarships for students. So uh, we started that this fall. The actual program will begin in the spring semester and students will be able to work on site at Clark Regional Medical Center while they're getting their medical assistant degree. So we've worked really hard here locally to actually bring some more programs and classes to the campus. Um, we also have adult education here uh, for Clark County. Um, BCTC took over the adult education program in 2012. We have our downtown education learning center, which is on 26 North Highland Street. They provide uh, adult basic education, uh, GED preparation, uh, English as a second language, um, they have a program at the Clark County Jail, and uh, they also do college prep for us here at BCTC. Um, we worked hard this past year. Uh, you may or may not know that the uh, GD testing changed from paper and pencil to online the computer uh, through Pearson View testing, and we worked hard to be able to get um, our facility here as a licensed testing site, and we actually are able to provide GD testing to uh, not only residents here in Clark County, but the surrounding counties who didn't get a chance to get a testing center approved in time uh, through Pearson View uh, because there's a lot of requirements and technical things that you have to have and, and ready to go. So we're happy about um, providing adult education here in Clark County. Um, some of the fun things that we've done, we've started Moonlight Movie Night here at the campus and it was successful. We had, uh, it's a free event for the community. We show free outdoor movies outside here, and um, we just had a really, really good time, and it's a good way to get people on the campus. I still hear people say, um, well, I've never been out here before, you know, and didn't know the campus was here, so this is a good way to pr provide um, an event to get people here and to give back to our community. Um, one of the reasons why we want to give it back is because the community's been so supportive of us. Thanks to the city of Winchester and Rails to Trails, we were able to put in um, a quarter mile walking trail that we called the Green. And then just two years after we put in the walking trail, um, our Glitz fundraiser supported construction of an outdoor amphitheater. So we have a 600 seat outdoor amphitheater out back and that's where we host our movie nights. And if anyone wants to uh, use the facility or use that outdoor space, uh, we would love to have you uh, come here and host your event or your meeting or whatever it might be. So some of the good partnerships that we're doing um, is working with the Clark County Public School System in dual credit. Uh, this fall, I think we have just right around 90 students that are in BCTC dual credit classes. Um, the tuition's waived for that and all they have to pay for is a $50 administration fee. So that's a really good deal. They're getting college credit at, um, uh, with tuition waived. 
Um, we partnered with uh, the Family Resource Centers and the Youth Service Centers with the school system this year uh, to bring ReadyFest on campus as part of movie night. Uh, I think we had close to 1,000 people here. We had more vendors than we'd ever had for ReadyFest and gave out more school supplies for those that really needed it in this community, and it was fun. Um, mentioned the partnerships with the Clark County Area Technology Center. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do the 1 plus 1 Integrated Engineering Technology Program and the welding certificates that we're offering, and with Clark Regional Medical Center with the certified medical assistant that we're starting up. Um, uh, more partnerships. Uh, we're partnering with um, the Winchester Transit. All of our students can ride the transit bus for free. All they have to do is show their student ID. And um, one of the things that makes us different and unique here is that we have a uh, top quality child care facility on site that's offered for students and the community. Um, they're top rated, three star rated, and they're the only three star rated in Clark County for six weeks all the way up through preschool. And there's not another three star rated facility uh, until you reach Moorhead east of us. So we have uh, really good child care on campus. And that's all I have. So thank you, Ms. Sarah. Turn it over to you. Coming and how many students you've uh, serviced throughout the year. So welcome, Cora. Thank you. I really appreciate all of you being here this morning. I think you know by now that community education is a program of the Clark County Public Schools, but we also receive some funding and some human resources from the city and the county. So it truly is a community program. And mostly what people think of when they think of community ed is our adult enrichment classes, yoga, photography, cooking, free classes like self-defense for women. This year we added a free genealogy class and our job skill classes like state registered nurse aid training. And we do average 40 to 50 classes during each semester in the fall and the spring. But the catalog itself has become a community communication tool as well. I sell space to all the nonprofits who want to participate at our cost after subtracting corporate donations from the printing and the postage costs. It's a very cost effective way to get information to the public. It goes to every household in Clark County. I do have some interesting new data we just compiled in advance of our 15th anniversary celebration next year. In our first 14 years, we served close to 114,000 people when you count all programs, classes, and events. Of that number, almost 56,000 were youth. We've had 4,500 volunteers. Over 1,000 of those were young people. And altogether, those volunteers have given us 29,500 hours. But community education's biggest task is support for preschool through 12th grade. We provide job shadowing for 8th graders. We did 124 in two weeks last spring. We're already getting ready for this coming March. We also do that with some high school students. We have the annual college and career fair that's co-sponsored with the chamber and the high school's youth service center. It's coming up November the 10th and you have till October 27th to register. There's no cost and we want large and small businesses and industries to participate. We help with things like ReadyFest, operation preparation, reality stores, health fairs, grant writing, anything the schools come to us and need help with. We've provided scholarships for 8th and 7th graders from local banks for the last several years. We facilitated a free running program for several grade levels for the last three years. We have Kentucky Scholars that provides incentives for students who take rigorous coursework regardless of their career plans. That has included a $2,500 scholarship from Columbia Gas for the past three years. School to Careers is a wonderful program we've been doing for 11 or 12 years. We've had various funding sources in the past, but this year we have a $7,000 grant from the Steele Reese Foundation. And we provide many grants to teachers and counselors for career development projects that are hands-on and that provide a wider range of experiences for all grade levels. Last year we had $10,000. We had 4,900 students participate in 17 projects at six schools. And as part of School to Careers, it's mandatory that the projects include community volunteers. And we had 255 volunteers give 877 hours. And last year and this year, we also um, give a little more weight to any of the applications that include soft skills for the students. We connect volunteers with teachers, such as speakers for classrooms, or when any particular resource need arises. We started Partners in Education in 2006. 
to provide human and fiscal resources to our schools. It's now a separate private nonprofit organization that continues to facilitate partners and volunteers to help our students increase achievement. And a lot of what we do, while not directly with young people, is for their benefit. When we provide budgeting and other life skills classes for free for adults through community services and the Homeless Coalition and spirit cards so that our senior citizens can attend school events for free, we participate in community health plan process, human services council, help our community become work ready certified, and the other 14 groups that I belong to. We're helping to build stronger families and a stronger community, and there's no doubt that our youth benefit from that. Please know that nothing we do is just community education. We collaborate and partner with other organizations and individuals for everything that we do. What I would ask our citizens is to participate in what we offer make suggestions for what you'd like to see us offer, and be engaged in our community. And that reminds me, there's a general election on November the 3rd. Please go vote. And remember that it includes a race for school board for those of you who might live in District 3. You can always check our Facebook page for news. Please like and share Clark County Community Education to help us get the word out. Or you can check our website, which is a tab on the school district's main webpage. That's all I have. Now, Mike can go on for hours. Yes, He's very passionate about what he does, but let's give you a few minutes to talk about what's going on. Uh, I will tell you, and, and, and I'm very proud to say, I've got the best job in the district. Um, our, th this is one of the greatest resources that you can imagine. Um, I worked in Franklin for four and a half years, and I'll tell you, this is probably easily one of the top five schools in the state of Kentucky. Now, it is a state-run facility. As much as I love Mr. Christie, he is not my boss. My bosses are in Franklin. But I will tell you, the quality of that school is due to the support of the school board and Mr. Christie and the partnerships that we have. Bruce has been outstanding working with us. The hospital has been an outstanding partnership with us. And so we run somewhere in there about five or 600 kids through there a day. Um, we have an automotive program. We have information technology. We have carpentry. We have welding. We have got the new integrated engineering. And we've got uh, health sciences. Uh, and again, thanks to the district support, we've hired a second uh, health science teacher, Teresa Cowan. She's been in the district, I think, like 19 years or whatever. A wonderful hire. I have got an outstanding staff, folks. That's why I can be here today, because they run that school. And, and I, I, I just want to tell you this, and this is off the subject, but I think we're going to recognize T Tuesday, hopefully, at the, at the school. He's my custodian. He's got a marketing degree from the University of Kentucky. But he worked with at risk kids like you wouldn't believe. You can go down there right now and he'll have two or three kids that have struggled in the classroom. And as long as they get their work done, they can come and work with him. And they flock to this guy. And that's that's the kind of staff I got. That they that they care about kids that much. And I've got I've got a kid living with me right now that I've got custody of, and it started because of his relationship with T. His mother's been arrested down in Florida. She's in jail for 12 months down there or whatever. He's a good kid, but it started because of T and his concern for kids. And all my staff are like that. We have got a tremendous uh, IT program in there. We hired uh, Robbie Barnes last year. He's a local guy with school for that. He does a great job. Our equipment. It's top notch. As a matter of fact, uh, yesterday or the day before, we just got delivered a $26,000 CNC router, which is a state of the art piece of equipment. We got a CNC plasma cutter and welding, state of the art piece of equipment. We got a new 3D printer coming. We've got a new tire changer coming for automotive. So it is a great, great resource. And that place honestly needs to be run 24 7. And because of Bruce and our partnership, we've got our first night class in welding that's going on two days a week. So if you haven't had the chance to come by and see it, it is a tremendous, tremendous resource. And I tell the kids, and this is just this is just me doing my preaching, but I think in today's economy, every kid needs an ACT score, every kid needs a skill. When they leave that high school, they need to have both. Because I think it just demands it today. And 
we do a lot, and, and, and I tell, I have very few discipline problems. If I have one a week, it's a busy week for me. And it's because of what those teachers do and the relationship that they're building with those kids and there. So if you get a chance, uh, please come see it. I appreciate the chance to talk about it. I will brag on it, and I can talk. I can talk for hours about what goes on with that school. It is a, it is a wonderful resource. And I, I really want to thank everybody. Christy's been a, a great help to us, too. Um, but, you know, anything that we can do to help the community, uh, we're big on community service. Uh, we're, we're working hard with Habitat right now. Uh, our carpentry program is in that so that we can go out and those kids need to give back to the community. And they need to see, you know, those that are a little bit less fortunate to be able to give back to. So, you anyway, know, thank you all. For answering questions, y'all have to There's a new thing too called the YES program that we're trying to push. You, you want to touch on that, Barry, because it's kind of with the DECO. Sure. So, DECO is actually, um, we are partnering with the state, um, something that's we're kind of pioneering. Um, we are connecting students who are in these career pathways to um, internships or co ops, um, even while they are in school. Um, they can be 16 years of age or older. So a lot of manufacturing companies especially have been nervous to do co-ops or internships and have kids that are 16 years or older on a manufacturing floor because of risk, liability, all kinds of issues. So at DECO, we're taking on those kind of liability issues. So we're partnering with the schools. The school system's on board. We've talked to a lot of the school system. They're excited about it. Mike, you're obviously excited about it. So our challenge um, is to work our connections with employers, with manufacturing, to help them understand, here's how we can make these connections. Here's some students who are getting some really solid skills in the area technology center and welding or whatever. You know, what about considering moving these kids, um, giving them internship opportunities to, uh, you know, so that when they get out of school, they're ready to come and work for you. And there's data, you know, 70 to 80 percent of students who have an internship are, you know, that much more likely to come and work for that company once they're done with that internship. So when they get their first job offer, 
70, 80 percent more likely to come work for you because you gave them that internship. So that's what we're doing with the YES program. You know, I think Cora mentioned the college career fair in conjunction, but we're actually going to have some industries and businesses at the school that are actually going to interview kids for jobs. We want to make it real that, that some of the underclassmen see these kids lined up, dressed up, got resumes in hand and all that to do interviews right there at the school in connection with this. So I think that's a big deal. Uh, I'll take just hired one of our kids the other day and after just a month or so he's already a team leader. Uh, but that came through, you know, our recommendation and, and quality of work. But, but, uh, so we're doing a lot of stuff, but again, those partnerships and, and developing that and being able to talk to is, I think, helping a lot as far as getting these kids in, in, in these jobs. Yeah, I think I think our new grade structure in the schools last year was the first year we had a five, six, and a seven, eight, and I think a lot of the things that are happening in the high school with colleges and careers are going to start to filter down and float down to our seven and eight. And, uh, I know what you're talking about. I think it's a good idea. You know, that's guidance and that's career planning and those all those sorts of things. And I think because we have a seven, eight now, we can start to bring that focus down from the high school to that junior high level. So we're actually looking at sharing teachers. High school, to the high school, they're actually moving back and forth a little bit more uh, flexible in our schedule and working with the junior high and high school. We're taking junior high students to the high school for classes. Uh, I think at the college level, um, you know, we we and students will benefit from all the work that is now being done at you know even as low as middle school and, and coming up the um, helping students to. Um, identify career interests, look at various pathways. I think that exploration is so critical. Um, you know, I've seen some statistics, I can't say it now, but the chances of, of like a career choice for a student um, is based a whole lot on what they see in their lives, you know, the people around them, what their careers are, you know, what they've been able to experience or know about. Um, so if they don't know about or experience some career that might be the perfect one for them, then they will, there's no way they'll ever choose that. So that kind of exploration, the support of students to really look at their own talents um, is, is critical. Um, we deal with that at the college level because, um, you know, sometimes it takes a while for kids to find their right spot. Or, um, again, if someone is transitioning out of a job, maybe they were on a production floor for a long time, you know, they lost a job or they want to look for something different. Um, so we also need to be really ramping up our services around helping students to find the right career paths. Um, the work and learn opportunities, again, huge right now in terms of um, the um, pathways from education into work to give students the opportunity to actually experience that um, uh, work uh, situation. Um, I had a nursing student one time leaving the program and she said, I didn't know there'd be so much blood. You know, um, <laughs> and, you know students have to be understands sort of what they're getting into. So, uh, you know, after a year of a nursing program, if you don't really want to work with uh, around blood, you, you've got a problem. So, um, you know, we need to stop that sort of thing and, and get students out so that they understand and experience that workplace so that they really do make good career choices. Because that's also part of the issue of cost of college. When students just mill about and don't have a career focus, families pay more money, it takes longer, and it isn't. so that's also a part of this issue of the cost of our education. And that's why we do job shadowing with eighth graders too. The most common thing for eighth grade girls to want to do, be a veterinarian, until they go on surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and there's blood. Yeah. Well, uh, a two-part question. Uh, the comment that I hear from the community uh, more often than not is the uh, status of uh, additional Facilities. You talked a little bit about the preschool. Uh, I guess my question is, where are we with regard to that project? And then the athletic facilities in the high school. And the second part of that is, when the uh, preschool moves out of Panama Court, uh, what are the notions and plans with regard to the use or disposal of that facility? Okay, let's see. Uh, I'll answer the second question first on the McClure property. We haven't got that far yet, <laughs> so don't know yet. Uh, on the first question, our facilities plan is up as of 
the list at the end of this year, first part of next year. We have the new and developed by April. It needs to be redone. The board looked at that at that its last meeting where they wanted to request a waiver. There were too many amendments to the old one, so it needs to be rewritten. But part of what we're going to charge the local planning committee with is to set priorities on preschool versus athletic facilities at the, at the high school. So those are two big building projects left. And then the third is the ongoing renovation of Campbell, which is going to be ongoing for a while. So. Uh, so the board is actually the local planning committee. Uh, when you look at that, um, there's a lot more community input there. There's lots of opportunities for that group to intersect with the community. The board's going to be at those meetings and listening. And uh, I think we ended up with the great configuration we did because we listened to what the public had to say. And we came up with something that was acceptable for the public. And I think that's, a, that's been a major structure moving forward. So I'd like to repeat that success with this. Well, the second part of that question, going back to Hannah McClure, uh, the, uh, I guess the question would be, when it comes time to declare that <coughs> surplus right. and dispose of it, uh, do you have to go through the same process you would for a piece of property you're selling to the public as if you were selling it to another public or transferring it to another public entity? Because I've had several people say, you know, that would be a great addition to the uh, park and recreation system. So, uh, do you have the same kind of rules at play if the city, county park system were to try to figure out a use for that facility, park and recreation related, as opposed to just putting it on the market? Well, I would say if there's any, if, if uh, all the entities in town can come together and come up with a really good use for that property, the school board, we wouldn't work with anybody. I think the McClure property versus the other three properties that we declared a surplus is apples and oranges because McClure is in the center of the city next to College Park, uh, next to College Park Gym, and it would make sense to have something that was, that was united there. Our other three properties are out in the county and didn't really have anything contiguous to them. So um, so I think the way that, you know, uh, what we do with the properties out in the county would be fundamentally different. But I'd be willing to work with anybody. The way that it's set up, the, the board, through the community can have some, some say and some recommendations, but ultimately, Kentucky Department of Education ultimately gives permission to what how to proceed with the, with the, with the facility. Thank you. If I'm a high school student, uh, there's one day a year where I can go, thanks to Cora's work, to, to shadow somebody in that job. job. But uh, I'd like to know how can I find out how many jobs are there for uh, any particular thing like a, a welder? Where can you get training in welding? What does welding pay? And are there differences in degrees of uh, experience and so on in, in welding and, and how is there a career ladder and so on. I need more information than I can just get from going and following a welder for a day. And where do I get that? Is, is that available to me, a high school student? Every student has to do all that information in it. It has things related to scholarships for all different professions. They Students are able to enter in any work experience they have. They're able to build their resume. They enter in extracurricular um, activities that they do and they can find out all that information. It's all in one place online for them and they can access Will that. Will somebody system. help me get into that system? You know, they better be. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's mandatory that students do that okay. starting okay. In, in junior high. Good. All right. I'm I'm out of high school quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually their counselor. Their counselor. Uh -huh. yeah, a lot of that information is available online. You know, what, what, you know, how much am I going to make as a welder? You just put that into Google and you'll, you'll get some good numbers. And what kind of education do I need? And, you know, all of this stuff is available online. Yeah. So, considering you have the entire internet in your pocket. So. First of all, I want to thank you for, for doing this today. I learned a lot about Clark County. I've been so embedded in Fayette County that this is my education and I appreciate it. Um, we have a nonprofit college here for, for the College for Technical Education uh, Cosmetology School. And um, 
the other thing is thank you for welding whoever's decision that was. Now we know where to send people, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> we believe in that anyone who comes in, if we don't have the program they need, we want to send them to the place that they can get it because that's they're not going to be happy here, they're going to drop out. We have to worry about our completion rights too. My I guess my biggest question in um, for Clark County is schools throughout the state of Kentucky, including Fayette County and Madison, they, they're very interested in the career pathways and very interested in, in college readiness. The students that don't get engaged in their own high school education. Um, where do the counselors, as far as Clark County, what is their, what is the expectation of the counselors to step in with those folks? Well, the one, one thing that I mentioned there is at the high school level, we have connections to where students are assigned, and it's not necessarily to a uh, grade level specific teacher. They're assigned to teachers, and they meet with those students, and they work, they spend so many so many minutes or so many hours a week working with each individual student talking about their needs and their desires of what they want to do, working with them in their, in their uh, individual plans. They meet with them weekly to do that. There's a certain time, uh, I think it's three days a week that's set aside for them to do that. Uh, so they, they actually, and it's, it's a low number, it's a, where each teacher would have 20 or less students that they work with. So it's not like they're working with large numbers of students. Now that's in addition to the availability of the counselors at the school and the administrators at the school, the area tech center, those teachers, those folks that are connecting with those. But there is a specific time during the day that every student meets with the teachers to talk about those things. Is, is there any, uh, in the curriculum of evaluating teachers, is, I know when my son went off to college, he said, one of the most important things is the mentoring of a student and the professors are, are evaluated annually on their mentoring of students. Is there any criteria for that in student teacher evaluations? That's got to be somewhere in the Aegis rubric somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the evaluation system is now mandated by the state. It's called professional growth and evaluation system. There's a level for teachers. There's a level for principals. Uh, we have things set up for central office staff. And of course, you, the public, evaluate us every four years. So, but um, that's that's included in that rubric. There actually, the, the Department of Education also, when uh, looking at our district report card, there are things like student voice where the students can speak up. And student input is actually considered when you look at our overall evaluation. Right. If you look at the, student, uh, the school report card section of KDE's website, there's actually one section which looks at student voice. And that's basically what students have to say about their classes, what students have to say about their teachers, and uh, what students have to say about the school system. What, what do you evaluate? Uh, in, in terms of dem demographics, if you talk about planning and looking down the road as, as far as the public schools are concerned, what, what do you see in terms of enrollment levels, say, the next five years, ten years out? Is it flat? Is it rising? Is it declining? What, 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 what do you see as the enrollment levels for the public schools during the next ten years in Clark County? Well, it's, we appear to be a little bit flat right now. Uh, we had increased numbers. At our high school this year, we had an increase of 60 students. Our, our numbers at the high school actually increased above what we were anticipating by about 60 students. Now, we were a little bit, a little bit lower. We can, I can tell you that our, presently our kindergarten class is a small class. Uh, when you get into our fourth grade, it's a large class. So there, there are fluctuations there, but overall, we're kind of on, we're, we're on a flat right now. We were on a growth. The rapid growth we kind of we're kind of peaked out right now we look at that uh, each year that's part of the budgeting process planning for the numbers of students projected enrollments and we look at of course the census reports that project out those things too but right now where I would, I would have to say we're probably at kind of a, at a flat level right now not wow. showing growth I would agree. We're probably we're, we're probably flat in. Like I said, there's a small kindergarten class. This kindergarten class was significantly down enough for make me to take a look at some other things. But uh, Fayette's is down, and so our neighboring counties are down. So that's just a down year. Well, the second part of the homeschooling, private schools. 
does the public school system track those numbers? And what, what's the, the homeschool and private schools in Clark County? What, what are those numbers like? Um, at, for this year, showing no increase. There's not been an increase. You know, that's not accounting for a decrease or anything that we might have seen anywhere. Uh, it's about equal to where it was. It's, it's kind of it's kind of flattened off too. Uh, so we're not uh, we haven't seen this year an increase in homeschool or private schools at all. I, I think where we saw some growth in air uh, when we went to the fifth grade, fifth sixth grade center, we saw some growth. I think uh, because now you've got a different kind of jumping off point from the private schools into the public schools where all the public school students come together. That used to be at the sixth or at, at the uh, uh, probably the sixth grade level in the middle schools, but you know, now it's at the fifth grade level. So that kind of jumping off point has been lowered a year. And Baker, uh, their enrollment was one that uh, it slightly exceeded what we had anticipated this past year. You know, Paul, it's probably interesting. We used to track this in the banking, but we've had a very flat new building certificate in residential housing here, and you can get that through the, the uh, city. Uh, and we used to track that for economic growth. And, you know, it's a delayed reaction. When are those, that demographic thing going on? get to the school system that's maybe something in the planning facility <coughs> plan you might want to get that data and graph it out. We, we use that data. We have a kind uh, that we work with in our budgeting process that does the demographics just like what you're talking about and we use a lot of that data and we will. I'm sure some of that's going to come up. Obviously it's going to come up. We'll be looking at preschool size of a preschool that we need to be determined uh, and that size is going to be greatly determined by what Hey, the Fayette County's got great growth, but we're, we're pretty flat, we're flat or, or have declined. I would say look in three or four years down the road, remember, I go to the hospital, I go to deliveries, and the number of deliveries at the hospital has been pretty constant over the past four or five years, so I wouldn't see any change from that. Either. Other questions? Go ahead. Um. <clears throat> I'm with United Way of the Bluegrass, and uh, I'm the director of our RSVP Trailblazers program, which is a federal program that pairs senior citizens with students in academic need, both in school and out of school. Um, Clark County, we're active here in Clark County. It's one of the four counties that we serve. Um, we're also developing a program that's right now primarily in Fayette County, but we want to expand it to the, the nine counties that United Way serves. It's called a Volunteer Impact Partnership, which pairs anybody in the community with schools in particular um, to volunteer with kids. We did that at William Wells Brown last year. They fell to the very bottom of the state. There were a lot of interventions in William Wells Brown. We can't take 100% credit, but we will take some credit for them having the largest increase in uh, the district in Fayette County. They increased 19 points on their K-PREP scores. Um, so could you speak a little bit to uh, the current scope? And we're also looking to come alongside Partners in Education who's doing this work here in Clark County, which is fabulous because it doesn't, it doesn't exist in, in some of the other counties, but can you speak a little bit to the scope and the need for community volunteers uh, in the public schools? We always need more volunteers in public schools. <laughs> have been go. for years and been mining all the sources that we possibly can and appreciate the Trailblazers through United Way. Um, Greg Yates is a coordinator for Partners in Education and he's on your Trailblazers yes. advisory council or board. Or yes. And I'm on his board and he's on my advisory council <laughs> so that we all work together trying not to duplicate services. Um, Partners in Education is doing a wonderful job. Their goal this year is to have two partners for every school, um, and I'm not sure where he is in that process right now. As I said before, they are a separate private 501c3 now, so um, I'm not, I don't always know all of the current data. But he also takes individual volunteers. It's not just businesses that he's looking to facilitate his partnership. Anybody who's interested in volunteering can do that through Partners in Education, and Greg will help hook them up. He's in touch with all the teachers. They let him know when they have a student who's in need, and that's his first job is to try to find somebody, whether it's through the partners or whether it's through an individual or through trailblazers. So we kind of try to keep all of that together mm -hmm. so that we're not duplicating and can be a little bit more efficient. 
Um, Roz has a great program, mentoring program at her school. She uses trailblazers, you know, yeah. education is there, and again, everybody's working together. But we all need volunteers. Yeah, and we are looking for more trailblazers. So if you know someone who might be interested, you can get a hold of me at United Way of the Bluegrass. My name's Gary Cremeen, so 55 and older, though. <laughs> Last-minute questions. Well, the Chamber of Commerce wants to thank each and every one of you for what you do for our community. Uh, let's give this this panel. <laughs> Cindy, do you have anything else to add? No, just at Golden Sarah. Thank y'all very much, and um, please encourage friends and family to join the chamber because we can connect everybody. That's that's what we're here to do. It's a big community effort. And you all know your children. It takes a village to raise all these children. So. All right. um, your Commerce Advocacy Team is proud to let you know that we are going to have an economic summit at the first part of December. So be looking for that information. And we're happy um, that we could host this today. And again, thank you all for participating. And thank you for being here. And thank you, BCTC, for hosting us and Winchester Federal for our food drink. So you all have a great rest of the day. Well, please pick up a copy of some food. Yes. Uh,